God's power over death is as real as his power over life, as we see in both the Old and New Testaments. Following are small samplings of scriptures dealing with hopes, hints, and the fulfillment of God's power over death that we have through Jesus. In the Old Testament, did you know that the resurrection of Jesus was shown and predicted? First of all, in the pictures, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and here in, then the fulfillment. So let's discuss in the Old Testament, first of all. In Genesis 22, 1-13, note especially verse 5, And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. God promised Abraham a multitude of descendants through Isaac, Genesis seventeen nineteen. But as chapter 22 opens, God asks him to cut off the obvious means of fulfilling that promise. Yet on the way to sacrificing Isaac, Abraham notes that he and his son will return. How? Hebrews eleven seventeen through 19 affirms that Abraham believed God could raise his son from the dead. That faith was clearly justified when God resurrected his own son, Jesus. We can trust God even when circumstances seem directly opposite to what he has promised us. Psalm sixteen ten through 11 says, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The New Testament indicates that David was not speaking of himself, but the coming Messiah. See Acts 2, 22-39 and Acts 13, 30-37. Yet David had confidence in life beyond the grave for himself as well, because he had confidence in God and God's promised Redeemer. Note David's response to this hope in Psalm 16. He is glad, he rejoices, verse 9, and has pleasures forevermore, verse 11. If David had such confidence in life beyond the grave because of the promise of God's Redeemer, who is yet to come, how much more can we have confidence now that he has come and we know him? In Isaiah fifty-three ten through 12 it says, When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This is part of the passage, uh, Isaiah fifty-two thirteen through fifty-three twelve concerning the suffering servant, ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. These verses point to the servant's resurrection inasmuch as he is promised descendants and a lifelong following the description of his being put to death as an offering for sin. Yet, compared to the clear revelation of the New Testament, it is like looking through a darkened glass. The resurrection of Jesus, reported in each of the Gospels, is the crowning reality to which Isaiah points. Isaiah 53 is the well-known passage that shows us the life and work of the coming Messiah. It is one of the best passages to share with a Jewish person who is willing to talk with you about Jesus. Now in the New Testament, we come to a few examples here. Uh, first of all, Matthew 22, 23-33, especially verses 31-32. It says, But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. The Sadducees, who do not believe in the resurrection, test Jesus by posing an unlikely scenario concerning the afterlife. Jesus points out the fallacy in their scenario. And he also cites the Old Testament's frequent reference to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to underscore the reality of life beyond death, since God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. The Sadducees' question indicated that they thought prosaically about the afterlife. Compare 1 Corinthians 2.9. As it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Our hope of the resurrection transcends anything we can imagine. The John 11, especially verses 14 and 15, says, Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not here, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. And when he had said those things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped in cloth. 
This miracle differs from previous examples of resuscitations inasmuch as the body had obviously begun to decompose. Not only is life restored from the grave, but the corrupting effects of death are reversed. From other passages in John's Gospel, we learn that for Christians, eternal life starts now as a quality of life with God and will also bring us beyond death itself. It is comforting to know that when we are born again, the stench of death caused by our sins is washed away forever. Now we see the prophecy fulfilled in all of this, in this final section here. In Matthew 28, especially verse 6, He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. See also Mark 16, 6, 9, and 14, Luke 24, 6, 34, and 46, and John 2, 22, 25 through 9, and 21, 14. Jesus' resurrection is never depicted itself. We are shown the aftermath. The empty tomb and Jesus' appearances to his disciples. The angels were at the tomb to greet the two Marys and send them on to tell others. We also see that the first person he appeared to was Mary Magdalene. At last, we see the empty tomb, which was to so long hinted at in scriptures and spoken of directly by Jesus. The words, he is risen, are not metaphors or maybes, but the reality on which we can be assured that we are indeed redeemed if we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, as it says in Matthew 16, 16, and have life through his name. That's why he wrote the Bible, he says in, in the book of John. He tells us that he sent his only begotten Son, God did, to take our place and die on the cross that we would live because he pays our penalty. If we just accept him and his offering on our account, our sin is washed away forever. This is what he teaches in John 3, 16, Romans 6, 23, and 10, 9. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ that is coming. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? Because the promise of resurrection was fulfilled in Jesus, Paul can teach with certainty about the hope of resurrection for those who trust in him. As the first fruits of a crop was a promise of more to come, so Jesus' resurrection is a promise from God that we who believe in him will also be raised from the dead. The entire chapter is a stunning statement of the hope we have and begins to pull back the curtain just a bit to hint at what is in store on the other side of the resurrection for all believers. So we see the fulfillment as well as further hints and hopes. As believers, we need not fear death. This chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, is full of comfort for believers in Jesus who are drawing near to the end of their own lives or are missing a believing loved one who has already gone on to be with the Lord. Among religious Jews, there is a faith in life after death. However, if you want to know what most contemporary Jewish people believe about the hope of the resurrection, the answer is very little. Like many in today's society, modern Jews often believe that we only live on through our accomplishments, our children, and in the memories of others. But what does this mean for our witness to Jewish people? Jewish people are no different from others in as much as the hope of eternity with a God that they do not know here and now is not especially relevant. Helping people see that God is real and that knowing him is a life-changing and life-giving experience is a good start. Explaining the gospel as his desire to be in relationship with us and his provision for us to enter into that relationship follow. For he said, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And these are verses, promises in Romans 3.23, 6.23, and 10.9. And just as he is one God, three persons, he is the God who saves all who come to him in faith.